since, uh, as you've noticed, we don't give a lot of time for the panelists for our panels at the summit, we're going to get started right away. I'm Oscar Nimlin Karlberg of Open Forum Europe. I think most of you have seen me at some point. So, but today I will be the moderator of this great panel. And like Paula said, on a topic that I think a lot of people will be interested in. So in my speech this morning, I talked a lot about the intense policy work from the uh, open source organizations across the world in the past year and a half. But today, we would like to have a panel and a conversation that goes beyond those legisla le legislations. We're in some ways past that. I'm exaggerating a bit because there are a lot of bits of standardization, implementation, and I think we'll get to some of those points today. But now really starting to look at the partnerships. What can government bring to the open source ecosystem? And what can the open source ecosystem bring to government when it comes to solving some of the very shared goals of increased cybersecurity and resilience? So I really will push the panelists today to get to suggestions and ideas for practical steps, projects, collaborations, etc., that we could be working on. And we're joined, and I feel like maybe this is a reason because there was so much work last year, but we're really joined by an esteemed panel uh, of policymakers and experts discussing this today. So we have Yuan Le Passar, Executive Director of ENISA. We have Lorena Boys Alonso, Director for Digital Society, Trust and Cybersecurity at DG Connect. We have Omkar Arasaratnam. He's the General Manager for the Open Source Security Foundation. We have Eva Black, Section Chief for Open Source Security at CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. I always get that one wrong. Uh, and we have Fiona Krakenberger, co-founder of the Sovereign Tech Fund of the German government. Well, let's get right into it. I think you should all uh, grab a mic if you have one. Um, but uh, I'll start with you, Yuan. How does ANISA assess the current landscape of open source security? What are the major challenges? How do you see just open source in the context of cyber resilience from your point of view? Yeah, good question. How much time do you have? Uh, <laughs> of course, part of the problem is the pervasiveness of the open source. 90% uh, of developer, develop, software developers use open source components. If you look at uh, companies, users, 80% of them say that they use open source because it brings down costs huh? if you if uh, vis a -vis the proprietary software um, at the same time when you look at the user side of course the big issue is uh, how do you help them making their risk assessments um, uh, when they use open source components how do you calculate in the extra risk vis-a-vis uh, -vis the proprietary um, uh, software for example so because if you know if you look at I mean, open source has strengths and weaknesses, I'm, you know, you know better than I do, but I mean, if you look at recent examples like the LibWeb, um, which is a piece of open source, uh, you know, tool, very good one, used to code and decode images, uh, a lot of web browsers use it, I mean, there are a lot of users. Uh, it shows how difficult it is to kind of, you know, uh, put this, in your own risk assessment to understand, okay, what will you do? What is your plan B if something happens? But also the other part is how can governments, we help the open source community to become better in, in helping their users um, and go with the flow. So I think there, I know Lorena will talk a lot about the CRA. Uh, I see this is a game changer. It's also, I think, an opportunity for us to really start building the community that we need. Uh, I acknowledge that uh, as an agency, we, we've had, of course, contacts with the open source community and we've used that, their expertise in some of the reports that we've built. For example, when we looked at how member states can develop um, coordinated vulnerability disclosure policies, we, we had a specific set which looked at open source security. Uh, in, uh, there is a uh, uh, guideline that we try to, and I don't want to make it uh, sound 
that I just made it up, so I'm going to read out what the title is, Open Source Software and Conformity Assessment, um, which we hope uh, we can publish quite soon, which is part of uh, the, our push of trying to help the open source community to align with the requirements of the CRA. So that is something that we are really looking at. So we, it's not only about what the threats are, but it's also what are the practical steps that uh, we as an agency, uh, uh, as an enabler of the member states to deal with the cybersecurity threats uh, can do vis-a-vis uh, -vis and in cooperation with the open source community. And then um, looking to you, Fiona, because you're right in the middle of government action in open source security. Um, so, of course, feel free to explain a little bit perhaps about the Sovereign Tech Fund, but uh, if you could interlink that with just the current challenges that you work with in open source security, and what are those implications for cybersecurity at large? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, there are obviously a bunch of things we could talk about, um, but I want to set the stage a little bit and want to talk about three things, maybe four if I can talk fast enough. Um, and uh, along that, I will also talk a bit about what the Sovereign Tech Fund does. So there are, uh, let's say, three things. Um, the first of them is when we talk about open source, we have to talk about open source infrastructure. The Sovereign Tech Fund has a mission to sustainably strengthen the open source ecosystem and does it by investing in open source infrastructure. So that is libraries, uh, developer tools, um, even programming languages, uh, standards and protocols and implementations. So these are the things that software developers need to even build software. It's basically um, everything, you, there's any imaginable kind of software development depends on these core technologies. This is also where this 96% comes from. This number comes from all these um, core and infrastructure technologies. Um, so this is used by everyone, but not everyone contributes or um, supports these kinds of technologies. Um, they're actually often maintained, developed by very small organizations or teams, um, volunteers, uh, sometimes just one person or even worse, no one. Um, and I just want to make it crystal clear that this is the, the infrastructure that we are basing all modern society and infrastructure on. And it's neither sustainable nor is it um, very healthy or it's going to be a threat and dangerous for any kind of security concept. It doesn't work without securing those um, uh, th those core technologies. Um, and uh, the Sovereign Tech Fund already invests heavily in these core technologies and there are ways to support it, but there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Um, one very, for me, very uh, um, yeah, representative example is Log4j. Just uh, quickly put your hands up. Who has heard of Log4j? Right. And so have all the companies and organizations that depend on Log4j. And all those organizations whose admins probably had a very long weekend after Log4j came. And yet, when we, um, the Sovereign Tech Fund currently supports the developers behind Log4j, and when we started talking to them, until we supported them, they didn't have a single full-time developer. Let that sink in for a second. Everyone knows that Log4j is really important, and it's still everywhere, but they didn't receive enough support to have a full-time developer. Um, so there's still a lot of work to be done, for sure, and we need more actors in the field and more people supporting that we depend on this infrastructure, it's just a fact. But we have to think about how we can create support mechanisms that work for the people who maintain it. Um, I will be really quick about the second and third point. Then, um, as you know, there's a lot happening in the regulation space, and I just want to flag that any kind of regulation that affects open source developers has to go hand in hand with a process design and afterthought, or like it can't be an afterthought to think about how we support open source developers in complying with these regulations. Because open source developers, they might have to comply with new regulations, but they, uh, to put it bluntly, they don't owe us anything. They are not our suppliers. Um, they often work on this in their free time. So how do we ensure they get the resources and the tools necessary so we don't create a very hazardous environment for them to operate in and because we will eventually rely on their work. Um, third, um, big news, uh, AI is changing a lot of things uh, that we know of uh, and also, or AI, I like to call it automation um, and those AI powered tools, they are very effective um, tools to be used by developers 
but I think we would be well advised at looking into how those tools actually affect software development and the resulting, that there are just lots of questions around accountability, about the accuracy and the reliability of code that is generated. The, in the recent weeks, we've seen a couple of articles in the security space around how it affects the security space tremendously. And um, even if the, the changes aren't as big as we might um, be worried about, there are going to be changes in how code is produced. Um, how it is documented, how people submit bug reports, and so on and so on. And I think there are just lots of open questions that we should explore to understand what is necessary from policymakers and people in decisive positions to take this into account. Um, fourth thing, fourth. Okay, quickly. Um, I just want to fl and like, just keep it in mind for the following conversations. Even if we had an infinite, indefinite amount of money, there are not enough people in the space, and this is a security hazard. As I said before, these technologies they need to be maintained, but there are some structural issues in this field that are really hard to wrap our heads around, but I think it is a collective responsibility to think about how we can grow the space in a reasonable way, in a healthy way, support the technologies and the community so they can have healthy growth in order to do all this work that's actually out there. No, perfect. They teed up the entire conversation way better than I ever could have done, so thanks. Uh, but uh, I think from Yuan's first intervention and Fiona, your four points, there is the obvious question that I think we just need to get to first. Okay, open source makes up so much of our digital infrastructure, it is everywhere. Can we trust it? Does it work? Mm, um, if we have these challenges, can we trust this? Is it an acceptable situation? I would strongly advise if you ever hear someone ask the question to reframe it or if this is a question in your mind because um, there's nothing inherently not trustworthy about open source. On the contrary, I'd rather trust open source than, um, than closed source. Um, there's nothing not trustworthy about it. Uh, and secondly, you don't really have a choice. It's the fact that we'll all have to use it. So it's like asking, um, should we trust water? Um, but seriously, because it's, it's the same kind of commonly shared resources, but there are ways to make water trustworthy. And as a public institution, as public institutions and governments, we have responsibility to make these shared resources trustworthy by filtering them, by cleaning them, making them accessible. And I think the same should apply for digital infrastructure and resources. <laughs> I'm happy to, to jump in, and I think from a policy-making point of view, because uh, I've been doing a lot of legislation, as you know, in the last <laughs> four years. Um, I think it's very interesting uh, to see, because I've been doing it for a while, how there has been a, a real change from a policy-making point of view, where in the past, like, open source was a little bit like, of, even if very open and very free, kind of dark from a security point of view, where all, oh my God, this is open source. Uh, a radical change to now, not only <laughs> this is not something where you could see it's trustable or not, is that basically it's being promoted for cybersecurity reasons. So, and uh, and we've, I mean, we've done it quite recently. Uh, well, I, I must say a, a very, very nice uh, uh, experience I had recently is the COVID certificate. That is one of the huge successes of of, of these commissions during COVID was all open source. Um, and recently we had very interesting debates in the context of another negotiation, which is the EU identity wallet, the EIDAS, where, and it came during the legislative negotiation, if we want this to be sure, let's make it open source, mandatory open source. So this, this is something that for me is quite telling, that uh, the EU is saying, if you really want your EU identity framework to be secure, make it open source. Of course, uh, with some caveats that I'm sure we will talk uh, later, uh, it is very secure because, of course, and this was said already by, by Johan, because it's open, because the whole community is checking, the, the updates, etc. but of course, uh, we have also the issue that it's in every critical infrastructure today, and that, okay, the code is very, <laughs> very accessible, so, um, so, voila, we need to, to keep it even more trustable. Uh, we need to make sure it's cyber secure, and this is 
exactly what we were trying to do with the Cyber Resilience Act, but I'm sure we will talk about it later. Yeah, I mean, I also feel like, uh, yeah, it will be inevitable to get to the Cyber Resilience Act. But I think there's also interesting to start now really looking, because there's some interesting stuff in the act that perhaps didn't get so much attention in, from the open source community, where there's a lot of interesting partnership opportunities uh, built in. But you want to hear, the, building on the great metaphor of water, how does ANISA deal with this water, uh, with the open source community, ecosystem, different stakeholders? Uh, I, I bet you've noticed that it's very different than calling a company or calling another government. How do you bring your operations together with open source ecosystem? How do, what does it look like? Yeah. Um, I really like the reframing of the trust issue, so that I think that was a great um, approach to this. Um, of course, the the issue always when it, when it comes let, let's take the example of Locked 4 j yeah? It wasn't a long weekend actually; it was a long weeks uh, up until we understood where exactly this piece of software is. Are we done? Yeah. <laughs> or uh, yeah, precisely. So I think that that kind of trigger the thinking and I think it also, also is, was quite informative for the Commission side and uh, I remember we had these conversations with the, at the expert level, okay, what does it mean? How, how do you validate the quality of the water? Huh? Um, and the, the, the first answer to this is actually part of the, the d definition of open source, that it's open. So you need to be open about where you use it. So the idea of the SPOM in the CRA, I'm still going back to the CRA before <laughs> you allowed us to do that. That is part of the solution of actually helping uh, the users to understand better their risks. Um, we look at it also very much from the risk perspective, but we are not the one who are the risks, risk owners. We are not the one who will say, trust this, trust that, don't trust it. You know, you, ca you can't have this argument. But you need, to be, you need to enable the risk owner to do this assessment. And I think um, that was a great first step, but we should not stop there. Um, because when I look at the, the other, the, the big issue is that, of course, you know, when you have a closed piece of software or proprietary software, you always have somebody who is responsible. So in case of crisis, you have a contact point. Uh, you, 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 know, you, you, you can ensure that there is an exchange of information between what they know, what is happening, and, and the users. In case of the open source, we haven't found the answer yet. Uh, who is the contact point? Sometimes it exists, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so we need to explore, and I think that's where I come in and say, well, listen guys, I think we need to start building these networks of communities so that once something happening, we at least have a conversation with somebody. Yeah? And it's not about responsibility, because normally when you say proprietary source, you say, ah, they are responsible, everybody looks at their mouth, mouth now, you know, gold eggs come out, uh, solutions, patches, etc. It's not about that, it's about having a better understanding what can be done and what can't be done. And I think, especially in the times of, uh, of uh, when, when you have a, you know, a cyber incident or a vulnerability, this kind of conversation needs to take place in a trusted environment. And you can't build trust overnight. So you need to start doing it now so that the networks are ready when something happens. And then st staying here with the policymakers, because you opened the, the two doors here, the CRA, but also the digital wallet. I think there are two interesting examples. Um, so, Lorena, from your perspective, in the CRA, EIDA slash digital wallet development, it holds a lot of promise for forging stronger partnerships between open source organizations and the governments. Uh, in what way? What, what can you, you don't have to promise anything, but what, what do you envision when you see like Article 17 A and B in the CRA? Sorry, it's a bit detailed, but. You are the, the one <laughs> quoting now the articles. Huh? I was trying not to go to that. Yeah. I assume you all know what the CRA says about open source or not. I have to. You, I think level set. 
Sorry? Level set. Tell. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, because you basically helped us uh, define what it says. I, I, I think that what the CRA says is, and it was a very, very interesting development. When you see what was in the original proposal and what's in the final legislative proposal. And I'll talk a bit about how we talk to each other because maybe we can improve. Um, what we tried to achieve, we, we tried at the beginning when we were doing the legislation. Okay, well, we need to cover open source, if, if it's really monetized. Sorry. Can sorry? you keep your microphone a bit okay, closer sorry. for our online audience? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I, I'm always told to have it in the left hand because I moved too much my right <laughs> hand. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, at beginning, okay, we, it was clear for us that if it is monetized, then we should need to cover it. And then, little by little, due to le legislative negotiation, we realized that it was not as simple as that. Uh, and you made us realize that, and, it, and we are thank very thankful for that. This is how we came with something which is fully tailor-made, where only if you are a manufacturer directly monetizing it, then you are basically covered by the, by the core uh, requirements. But then we have this nice concept that I don't know if it came from you or from us, but I like it, the stewards, uh, it sounds so nice, uh, where basically we make sure of, to tackle one of the issues that have been already uh, raised, which is, okay, what if you are in this uh, foundation, in these communities where you don't directly have the intention to monetize, but in the overall setting, this is monetized, and, and, and my people say, no, don't give examples, don't give examples, but of course we looked a lot to the car manufacturing environment, which is uh, uh, this Eclipse, one, one very nice example, where there you have a tailor-made uh, system, and then you have um, the uh, voluntary uh, attestation program that I'm sure we will talk about, which I find is, is a very nice way of dealing with, okay, uh, helping manufacturers that are introducing components to fulfill their due diligence. So it's something which is good for everybody. It would even be very nice that uh, they pay for it <laughs> so that uh, because they benefit. Um, and also I think uh, we did something which is very nice as well, which is making sure that there is something that is brought back to the community. So that if uh, you are using open source components and you find uh, and you fix a vulnerability, please share it then uh, uh, with the community. So I, I think it's, it's a beautiful system. Now, talking more about how we will implement it and all that, um, I would like first to talk about this first phase. The fact that it was during the legislative process that suddenly we started to, to receive plenty of messages. We had to engage with you all. Sometimes um, in a way that was not so easy to understand each other because we were not talking the same language. We are policymakers, um, and you are not, uh, even if you have become really uh, <laughs> very, very experts in this. I wonder if uh, for the next iteration of uh, a legislative act, if we need to continue in that way, uh, a more structured uh, way to organize yourself will not be good. Where somehow you unite all your different uh, communities within the open source community. Uh, you somehow get a bit of training on how to talk to policymakers, which is a thing in itself. Uh, um, and uh, I mean, that's what everybody does. Huh? Uh, it's just that uh, we are not so used to talk to you. Now, now we became. So that's something that we thought at the time. If we had made this engagement even before the proposal, if, and we try with that public consultation, we did our overall usual thing. Um, maybe ne next time we can organize it better. So this is, uh, and we are fully open to discuss how to do it. Uh, in terms of the implementation, you know that now we will come with guidance. So uh, we will certainly involve the community in, in preparing the guidance. And we will come with, of course, the delegated act on the, on the program, uh, where, of course, we will need to involve you as well. So we will need to discuss on how, but certainly you, you, you uh, will be involved uh, 
Um, for you to know in terms of support, because you were discussing you as well, uh, Fiona, on, on, on support to uh, how now are you going to implement all this, um, apart from the guidance uh, that we will, of course, uh, issue, and that will certainly cover open source, uh, for you to know that we have launched calls so for proposals. It's around 30 million, if I not... Uh, if my memory is correct. Uh, they are open right now, so hurry up if you want them. Uh, I think the deadline is in uh, March. Uh, it's for implementation, it's to facilitate implementation. Uh, and we have a clause that is giving preference to open source. So go for it. Voilà. And I think uh, I would also encourage everyone to take a look at that because there's a lot of opportunity for innovation around the tools that could be tailor-made for not just open source communities, but SMEs. As a rule, what will work for open source communities will most likely be quite good for SMEs as well. But here, I'm going off piste a little bit because I, building on your answer here, I'd like to bring Eva in because you are now a government official, but you are very much an open sourcer in terms of background. So in response to Lorena's uh, uh, reflections here about, um, you know, how would you organize the open source community? You yourself, how would you do it? But like, what do you need now when, when you're on the other side in terms of responses? And yeah. Uh, so for those who don't know me, uh, I've been a, a developer of open source software, a contributor, maintainer, uh, project founder and lead, uh, all of those things over the past 25 years and only joined the public service six months ago. So still finding my, my footing as it were. Yeah, <laughs> um, and also uh, quickly learning the constraints. Uh, <laughs> You'll survive. Yes, yes, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. It's just uh, it's a fire hose of new information um, and and a joy. Uh, so your question, I think, was two parts. Yeah, well, well mostly like how how can what information do you need? as a government official now. Yeah. And how, when you're with your experience from the open source ecosystem, do you think that could be organized in order to be provided? Okay, so the panel has already talked about uh, trust and risk. Uh, if you're drinking water out of a stream, it's probably responsible to make sure it's been purified, for example, right? Um, there are corollaries for open source. If you're just grabbing a package off the internet, you probably should do some diligence to know where it's coming from, what's in it, uh, has it been peer reviewed, other attributes that you might care about before running it in production or putting it in a car. Um, an SBOM is a step in the right direction. I think it is essential, uh, both for closed source proprietary software, or commercial software that includes a large amount of open source and for open source projects. But an SBOM, in my opinion, uh, and this is an ongoing debate in everywhere, um, it's essential but insufficient. It gives us necessary information that empowers consumers, but it is not a complete picture today. To build an SBOM for a large complex software package, uh, in many cases the SBOM is larger than the software package. <laughs> Um, uh, I think there are or can be uh, other approaches that provide the degree of supply chain transparency, both in proprietary and open source, um, that would empower consumers, empower defense teams when there is the next log for shell, because vulnerabilities happen. We had a big one in Docker and Run C just a few days ago. Uh, it's, it's also pretty bad. Um, and uh, knowing if, if a container runtime is in your product is not necessarily obvious. Um, so having uh, artifact uh, dependency resolution in a compact machine readable way, I think this is the kind of technology that would help all of us, that an SBOM is a step towards, but not yet there. Um, and that would help build trust. I think there are other techniques uh, such as taking the knowledge that open source communities have long had in how to work in the open. Um, uh, going back to my early days working with Debian and the Linux kernel, 
peer review and the artifacts generated by doing peer review and performing it in the open, everything from signed commits to sign off by reviewers, all of those, when made visible to the consumer, can help build trust. Uh, but it's complicated, and so there's work that can be done to make that easier to consume. But could I ask, in, in terms of the US government looking at the open source ecosystem, it seems like there was a point where just the, at least Europe um, asked for, you can't say that the commission didn't ask for input. Um, the, it was a public consultation, it was all there. And there were, as we heard at a workshop yesterday, very few uh, stakeholders or organizations that raised open source concerns. Uh, is it enough with the open source ecosystem to simply have an open consultation or does the government need to change to some extent? Um, a few comments on that. I do not intend this to be a criticism to my European counterparts, but I have, um, <laughs> um, I have, I have heard, uh, since I was not part of any response to the initial request for input on the CRA, um, I can't speak for myself, but I've heard from colleagues that the word open source and even the word software wasn't mentioned in it. Um, in the earliest one, again, I'm going by hearsay, uh, but it is, it is concerning that there were only two responses about open source, I agree. I don't know why. Um, the the uh, US government, ONCD, published an RFI last year. We had 130 responses, give or take, 115, um, about open source security. Uh, so I, I, I don't know why. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm fishing for an answer here. What are you building at CISA? What am I building at CISA? <laughs> um, Stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I, hmm. Well, honestly, I, I, can, I, can I intervene yeah, yeah. on this point of uh, two responses? I mean, it's like, and I think that was one of the pleas that Lorena made, is that, uh, I mean, the Commission cannot go and build an open source community which would then respond to the Commission's request for comments. You need to build it. Huh? So it's, you know, I'm dealing with uh, tech and cybersecurity daily. I have much more responses to the other side of the, you know, the pond from the United States than I have from the European community. So, I mean, and again, I think it's, it's, it's not on the Commission, it's, it's really on us in this room to ask, why is that? I mean, if I have a certification conference and there are 2,000 participants and 1,500 participants are Americans, why is that? So I think it's, it's our own ability to, um, to be proactive in, in these matters. Okay, part of the fact is that a lot of these software development happen in the other side of the pond. And I also see and uh, greatly admire... But it's not on Lorena. <laughs> I, I also... I, I, mean, I, 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 but go ahead. I, I, I see and admire and have been learning from the amount of engagement from the public sector in Europe. You have, uh, what, about 100 OSPOs now across the, the, the Union? I think we have two in the US, maybe, maybe four. It's less than 10 that I'm aware of. So like, there is a great deal more engagement on the public sector side that I'm observing and trying to take knowledge and, and bring it back into my organization and spread it across the civilian executive branch. Uh, and, and to clarify your question about what is CISA building, perhaps I should clarify what CISA does. Um, we work in the federal civilian executive branch, so no work uh, on military, secret, none of that. We are here to help secure uh, public sector infrastructure and government infrastructure on the civilian side. Uh, so. We have uh, published last September an open source roadmap for CISA's work. This is effectively the public statement of what we're building for the next couple of years. Uh, among the various steps there is piloting, developing uh, uh, guidance on how to build federal OSPOs. We're trying to stand one up ourselves, <laughs> thank you, um, and trying to evangelize and be a resource for other federal agencies that want to build an OSPO. Uh, we're also trying to study the prevalence of open source usage, both directly and within commercial products, across federal civilian branch and in critical infrastructure sectors. Uh, we don't have 
that data yet. I know from having worked in the private sector for most of my career, even most companies don't have a clear, complete analysis of the open source uh, composition of, of every product they've bought, right? This is breaking new ground for many of us. S-bombs are a step towards breaking that ground. But and here, uh, I think, Omkar, you're in a very good seat to also, you've, I can't think of anyone who has spoken to probably more companies and governments about exactly these questions in the last couple of years. How would you reflect on your different experiences, let's say in different uh, geographies? Uh, how are governments engaging with open source communities, but also how are open source communities, including the one that you're working with, engaging with governments and what is it looking like? It's a great question. Um, let me first start by acknowledging some truths that we can all agree on. Open source is a public good. It's not an American good, it's not a European good, it's not an Asian good, it's a public good full stop. And the second truth is, and I've only been doing this for 20 years, so if somebody knows differently, please tell me, security is hard. It is really hard to get right. And I've worked on this both in large commercial entities, many of whom are <laughs> present here, as, as well as the open source community, and full stop, it doesn't matter how you do software development. It is incredibly difficult. Policy making is incredibly difficult. I'm a software engineer. I identify as a software engineer that's been doing security for a long time. Your world is incredibly difficult as well. You have to navigate through trade agreements that may have been set up 100 years ago and try and find a path forward. Um, but I think this really comes down to two topics, the what and the how. The what, we want to make things secure. But let's, get, let's add another truth to this. There are many organizations, billions, some even in the trillion dollar range, that are fully compliant and have been breached, right? So even if we find the absolute perfect standard, people will comply with it, and the security property that we're seeking may not be there. But if we put that aside, that imperfection and really regard it as a principle or a goal that we'll eventually attain. I think the how is really important. Um, within the OpenSSF, we are trying to facilitate that discussion with open source stakeholders, with public sectors such as yourselves. In fact, we're in the stages of planning a conference uh, later this year in which we hope to bring together both policymakers as well as open source contributors and the private sector because being a public good, the stewardship of open source is really a combination of public sector, private sector, and most of all, our community. And by bringing those resources together and acting as facilitators that translate, it's not going to be the individual developer, and I'm particularly passionate about this. I, I'm, I'm one of those weird guys that still writes code, like some of my Christmas vacation was spent filing pull requests. And when I think about this, I'm like, what if there's a vulnerability in it? Well, somebody's going to have to figure that out. <laughs> we do have to figure that out. But by bringing everybody together and having that dialogue and helping to bridge between a policymaker that may not be a trained software engineer and a software engineer that certainly knows little about policy, I think we can ameliorate and find the middle ground. To speak a little bit about some of the work that we've done with Ava's agency, um, one of the interesting things we're working on is what does happen. So there's the Run-C vulnerability. Ava and I spoke about that because we were friends <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. That's not scalable, right? Mm -hmm. And we need to figure out a way of doing that. Ava, I think you've got some work coming up that should help in terms of tabletop, et cetera. Mm. Way to spill the beans. <laughs> <laughs> Whoopsie. Uh, but in general, it's bringing everyone to the table. Right, and I think it's very easy, especially when we're under the pressure of really bad actors that are out there, that there's a natural tendency to worry, to enclose, to kind of constrict and stay within. If we can find the right forums in which to engage proactively, whether it's Run-C, whether it's Log4j, whether it's whatever's gonna come up next, there's gonna be something that's gonna happen next. We need to be prepared and ready. And the more that we kind of tear down the uh, I'll say the borders of self-interest in that pursuit, I think the better will be. 
I also really applaud not just legislating stuff, and I think both Fiona's work as well as Ava's work speak to this, but working with the community. Like when we think about open source development, it's not like when my team was writing code at Google. It is completely distributed. We can't just insert something into the software development life cycle and say, aha, secure. And some of the creative ways that we're doing that with our partners is by looking at things like software repositories. Where's the software being held? Through software like OpenSSF scorecard that helps, as Johan was saying earlier, well, how do I know the software that I'm consuming is secure? OpenSSF security scorecard provides a report card that allows you to see that. It may not be objectively secure, but it allows you as taking that dependency to understand how you're going to manage the risk. And here, I feel like uh, there's a thing that we're just to tee up like some of the discussion questions, and we're essentially out of time. So I think we'll have to continue discussions after this. But uh, so OFE, as my organization, we're in a peculiar position because we work with policy of open technologies. Uh, so uh, trust me, sometimes it's hard to get a hold of the right people in the open source community to get the input. We know this as well. But there is this classic metaphor of open source. It's the cathedral and the bazaar. And we really feel like this applies to the political and policy discussions of open source related questions as well. And here, um, there is a cathedral-like element of the commission and the way the EU multi-stakeholderism system works. And there is an undeniable bazaar quality of how open source is being developed created and talked about and discussed in political circles. And the question here is perhaps, what could we do immediately now? Because the goals of security we share to just bring the Bazaar and Cathedral closer to each other because they are there building OSPOs we heard. There are a call for proposals to build tools and just to end, um, starting with you, Omkar, randomly, <laughs> uh, what can you think of that we could do starting almost now, just to build this uh, bridge, the cathedral and bazaar? Let's presume good intent. And I know as a technologist, it sounds really odd for me not to come up with a technical solution. But I think uh, to credit especially a point that Ava had made earlier, the open source community is about trust, it's about safety, and it's about the public good. So starting with an assumption of good intent, I know the CRA was created with good intent, I know our communities operate with good intent, and while, to get back to my bifurcation of what versus how, while the how might seem quite foreign, I think trying to find that middle ground where we can have these discussions and continue to evolve both the maturity with how security is applied to open source, as well as how governments support and understand open source, I think is the best first step that we can take. Fiona? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, it's a bit complicated, maybe. Uh, let me elaborate really quickly. Do not forget what, how this field is comprised. We're talking about open source developers. They don't get paid eight hours a day for the 12 hours a day <laughs> they spend beside their other job to fix critical security issues. So I think we have to, I think there are some quick fixes and there are things that we can do now. I would love to see next year more maintainers in the room, maintainers on the stage, including maintainers and their, like, including their reality and our considerations. Um, but there's a systemic issue. So open source developers, we're often talking about them or open source people, maintainers, if it was some homogeneous mass, but it's not. There are huge organizations, super well organized. There are like large organizations with hundreds of people. There are small intermediary organizations and foundations who represent people. There are small teams, there are volunteers, there are stressed out one person teams who are working on this thing uh, on their weekend. Some of them, like, you know, as a hobby, some of them because they have to, because there's literally no one else doing it. So who do we expect then to submit a long response if they are not organized yet? So 
there are some systemic issues in this field that I think we have to acknowledge and realize and come up with um, support mechanisms in any direction for participating in policy discussions, for supporting their work, financing them, um, issuing the, the communities with resources they need that cater to the diversity of actors that we have in the field. Maybe we need a fellowship uh, for people, for maintainers to do policy work for you, to learn this stuff, because it's hard, it's difficult. Um, but we cannot, it's not like a fossil we can turn on and off. Like there are some, there even then, just like this, there are not a lot of people and like the amount of people and the diversity of people definitely has diminished for the last couple of years, especially via COVID. So who do we expect to be able and ready to contribute and read this entire thing? So just so full circle, I think there are some systemic issues that we have to acknowledge and realize and then we have to build up and hone this community and ecosystem and see it as a whole in order to get something out. Eva, last words. The quick fix, and you're allowed to say a long-term fix as well. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for governments to work to support this ecosystem. It is different than business to all the previous comments. Um, it is a largely volunteer-driven and corporate-driven and hopefully now also public sector driven. Um, collaboration on software, but we need to work towards building more uh, measurements in how we trust the software we're consuming and enabling people to also make those assessments. Uh, I think the long-term solutions are, are harder when we need them also in the short term. Um, you want? Yeah, I wish I would have taken my pen to write all of these good ideas down, actually. I, I, I think, um, there are a few things that I've heard that I very much agree on. I think the one is, actually, I don't agree with your example of the cathedral and bazaar, because it's kind of, I think it's more about, you know, you, you have a, like, a, a scripture-based, very monotheistic religion, and on the other hand, you have very free and open and a bit more that stuff. Um, I think we need to acknowledge the heterogeneity of this community. And I think if you know you're right, I mean, it's, it's not that there is a single very diverse open source community. There are different roles in the open source community. There are different drivers in the open source community. And I think that also needs to be acknowledged. Um, and if you build up something um, as a partner, let's say, uh, for, uh, for policymakers, for policy implementers, um, probably it's not going to be one, it's going to be several layers and I think that's also something that we need to acknowledge. We need to accept as uh, public bodies that it's, it is going to be also in the future very heterogeneous, very dynamic, very quickly changing uh, community um, and not so much wish that we could shape it in a way that it's easier for us to, to have a negotiation with. I think that's also something that we need to learn how to do that. And in this vein, I think there is also a lot we can do as, uh, as, uh, as public bodies in order to translate and interpret the stuff that we already have so that it would be useful for the open source community, understandable, applicable. Uh, and there, actually, I would, uh, I'm looking very much at the very good work that, uh, that CISA and NIST has been doing over the past 10 years in, in developing kind of not strict standards, but more like frameworks that you can use. Um, and I think that's something that we, you know, we as, as, as Europe can, I think, uh, uh, draw some lessons. And I know that uh, we have an ongoing cyber dialogue with, uh, with the US and I uh, hope that, that in this framework we can also find new approaches um, in our continent. And the last words of the panel. <laughs> I'm in fact very optimistic uh, because it is true and I have to acknowledge that there are parts of the, the commission is a big thing. I will, I will not call it a cathedral but it's a big entity uh, and there are parts of the commission that work very closely with the open source community. Our colleagues from DigiDigit, I mean, in the, in the commission, we, we even have a, an open, open source program office. So th there is really uh, this culture in certain parts of the house. Now, 
in my part, little part of the house, it is true that we have had a tendency often to engage with those with whom or to whom we regulate. And it is true that before the CRA was even thought of, uh, I mean, who on earth was thinking of regulating software at all? Uh, and then suddenly we dared and said, okay, we, we are going to do it. We are going to make sure that uh, we regulate software as well. And then suddenly you discover plenty of communities you are not used to engage with. So the, my positive part is that now we have discovered you, basically. <laughs> we had to. Uh, we have learned that basically we, at the beginning, didn't even know how to talk. Uh, now I think that, honestly, on your side, maybe you've learned that you maybe need to be organized differently if you need to reach what you call the cathedral, but also on our side, uh, that maybe we don't need to talk to you only for the purposes of how we are going to regulate you. Uh, but that there's a lot of talk uh, and engagement that needs to be done to ensure security completely outside legislation. And I think the, the, the implementation phase now gives us this chance because we will not have the choice. We will, we will need to organize ourselves. Uh, on that, I must say, uh, it's good I'm sitting at the next to Johan, I even had lunch with him, um, that we will do it together because you were comparing me to CISA, but we, I'm, I'm, I don't compare myself to CISA, I'm maybe DHS, but not, uh, uh, we are not an agency. So uh, for this phase of more uh, direct engagement, we will need to do it together with, uh, uh, with ANISA. Uh, and uh, we are already talking about well. I have to say, I share this optimism as well, so thank you very much, all panelists. Looking forward to continuing this discussion this afternoon. Thank you.